Welcome back. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And to our first major discussion, the Independent National Electoral Commission will not release the electoral timetable for the 2023 general elections until the Electoral Act Amendment Bill is signed into law. This is revealed by the chairman of INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakub, at the commission's first quarterly consultative meeting with political parties. And uh, what are the implications of this for the polity in Nigeria? We have uh, joining us to look at this, uh, former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly, uh, Mr. John Gore Lebo. And of course, also joining us via Zoom is the commissioner, um, the National Commissioner for Information and Voter Education at the Independent National Electoral Commission, uh, Mr. Fessus Okoyo. Gentlemen, welcome to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, let, let's start with you, Mr. Fessel Zukuyo. What, what is the thinking uh, behind this decision as announced by uh, the National Chairman of INEC? Well, I, uh, if, you, if you recall, uh, the chairman appeared before the Senate uh, 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 co committee, uh, saddled with the responsibility of uh, overseeing um, issues uh, uh, around the electoral process and the commission uh, when they were considering an, an act to um, um, uh, bring about an electoral offenses commission. Now, at that particular meeting, uh, the chairman made it very clear that one, that the commission is desirous of releasing the timetable for uh, the conduct of the 2023 general elections uh, after the Anambra governorship election. But the chairman also made it very clear that it is imperative, that it is fundamental, and that it is also important to have some level of certainty and some level of clarity in relation uh, to the constitutive electoral legal framework that will guide the conduct of elections uh, before we release the timetable and schedule of activities. And he urged the National Assembly and all the parties concerned uh, to. Uh, you, you know, uh, to um, get to work in relation uh, to the um, alterations to the Constitution and the amendment to the Electoral Act uh, so that we can release uh, the timetable on time. Now, as you know, uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission cannot close its eyes uh, to what is going on uh, in the National Assembly and also within the presidency. Uh, the Commission was part of all the processes and procedures uh, that led uh, to the um, amendment of the electoral legal framework uh, before it was sent to the president uh, for purposes of assent, and the president declined assent on the basis of a particular clause uh, in the electoral in the in in, in the bill. And so, what the chairman is saying is that we need to wait a little bit uh, before we release the timetable and the uh, schedule of activities because of what I call the differential timelines in the in the. Um, in the old electoral, uh, in the existing electoral act, and the and the new act, uh, and the new bill uh, that may be signed into act, if we release the electoral, if we release the timetable and schedule of activities now, there will be a problem. And as we go on in the discussion, I will point out the timelines that are problematic and the timelines that uh, must be taken into consideration before we release the the timetable and schedule of activities. And unless Unless the party is concerned, unless the National Assembly and the presidency resolve the issues involved uh, in the new uh, elect electoral, electoral bill speedily, it may affect the timelines provided in the new electoral act sought to be um, uh, in, the, uh, in the bill sought to be converted into an act. Okay, but um, I'd like us to get some clarity because at that time, before the governorship election, just before we, you know, we uh, bring in John Gore Lebo, uh, the chairman had also mentioned that according to the principle that established the commission, that there would, the elections would happen uh, February 18, 2023. And so what does this mean? Uh, is the election still going to happen? Whether or not the bill is signed at that particular date, or will we have a letter date? Well, uh, you know, if you look at Section 178 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it has pigeonholed the timeline uh, within which the Commission uh, must conduct the 2023 general elections. And the timelines provided in Section 178 um, uh, uh, of, 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 of the Electoral Act and the, and the uh, other sections of the, of the, I mean, um, of the Constitution 
uh, are, are cast in stone. Those timelines are even there. The commission can only operate uh, within, the, within the circumference of those uh, timelines. We have given the nation um, a particular date that we are going to conduct uh, the presidential election on the 18th day of February uh, 2023. Uh, so what we are doing as an electoral man management body is that in terms of the timelines, in terms of the activities and so on, we are counting back from the 18th day of February uh, 2023, back backwards. And if you, let me just give you an, a practical example of the type of challenge we have. Uh, the existing section 30 of the Electoral Act 2010 as amended obligates the commission, mandates the commission uh, to give notice of the conduct of elections 90 days before the conduct of that election. That's what the existing Electoral Act says. But in, if you look at clause 28 uh, sub 1 of the bill sought to be amended, that particular bill, uh, if it is signed into law, it provides that the, that the commission must give the notice of elections uh, 360 days before the date for the conduct of the election. So the implication is that if you count from 28th day of Feb of, from 18th of February 2023 backwards, you can see that time is really, really, really running out in relation to our giving that particular uh, uh, statutory notice provided in this new electoral framework that, uh, uh, bill that, that has not been signed. And if it is not signed in relation to the period that we have uh, marked for the conduct of the, the elections, the implication is that the National Assembly must go back again if they want us to use the new electoral legal framework to amend this particular clause to bring it into conformity with the timelines provided in the Constitution and provided in the uh, other, other instruments that the Commission will use for the conduct of the election. Yeah. All right, so l let's also bring in uh, John Golevo before I allow my colleague Kofi uh, to also ask his question. Um, John Gall, at this point in time, uh, the former INEC chairperson is saying that the National Assembly should not override the president. And now the senators are agitating. Of course, they're gathering signatures. So far, they say they have 73 signatures. And INEC is also saying without the um, electoral um, you know, act being signed, there will be no timetable release for the elections. Do you think that there's hope for this bill to be considered, reworked? and send back to Mr. President, and that having the assent of the President? Yes, I think, I think so. Um, the amendment being proposed, and the law in question is quite a critical law. The Electoral Act and the Constitution forms the baseline of the legal framework for conduct of elections in Nigeria. The assent of the President in such a critical bill that required um, executive implementation require budgetary provisions to that effect. It's such a critical deal. So I think what will happen is that I don't think the National Assembly will override the President's assent. What I have seen happening is that um, based on Section 58 of the Constitution, um, Section 58 sub uh, 2, it does not allow the President to pick and choose the provision of the law that he can sign and not sign. But the National Assembly can under Section 58 sub 4 you know, amend that provision in line with the president's letter and return it back to the president for action, which is what I think will happen now or what I say happening. I don't think they will override the president's action because the reason the president has given, has given is very fundamental and critical. Number one is that before now, political parties, you know, were allowed the freedom of democracy to conduct their primary. And they have three options. They have consensus, they have direct and they have indirect. It's in the it's all in their constitution as the part of the electoral uh, the old elect electoral act in section eighty seven. Now, why do you now want to impose just one model of conducting primaries on all political parties? You know, the Supreme Court has pronounced on this matter several times. You know, there's the case of Imam against Ushishi. The Supreme Court was very clear that based on the provision of that law, that it was the right of the political party to conduct their internal matters and preserve their candidates. So I think the best thing that will happen with Okay, so w we seem to have lost. By 
Mr. Jongo Lebo, are you there? Can you hear us, please? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we lost you for a bit, so if we just take your point from the last sentence okay, again. So, so, okay, so the point, the point I'm making is that you cannot, the options available to the National Assembly today will be to apply the provision of Section 58, sub 4 of the Constitution, which allow them, you know, to amend the, uh, the bill and then in line with the letter of the president, send it back to the president for assent. Is it critical that they have the president assent in this bill? Okay, Mr. Lebo, um, um, uh, you, you uh, um, have experience as a, a legislator, you also have experience as a politician, and if you look at the legal uh, profession, you're also there. Um, uh, what implications do you think this has for uh, the forthcoming election? Some uh, of the, the papers have, have said, you know, the election is hanging in the balance. Um, this, this unset do you think this throws the elections into a sort of an uncertain state or you think that uh, there is no cause for alarm and no cause for serious concern? Mr. Jongo will label. Yeah, I, I think that um, it doesn't throw the election into any balance. Uh, Mr. Fess Okoye has already explained the uh, period of time notice required to be given within the election has been expanded under the new law. Uh, INEC has already indicated that the election will hold in February. What is required is that INEC needs to provide the guidelines to the election and the manual, which is an important provision of um, responsibility of INEC. But they cannot bring out the manual or the guidelines to the election unless the electoral act is passed. Um, for me, you must commend INEC. They've done the, they've laid the foundation, and the foundation is that you know election will hold in February. You know, and then you, what is fully required is that under the circumstances now, the guideline uh, has to come out and the mandate of the election has to come out. So once this bill is passed, which I hope will be passed, will, will happen today and forwarded to the president, is that said to come in this week. All of that will come back. I think it has laid the foundation for all of this to happen. Uh, I hope that the National Assembly will not drag us beyond this week or next week. If that is done, they will be able to meet up with the time. The provisions under the law, is not expanded for a longer period of time. But INEC doesn't have that time. But I, I believe that with what is happening on ground, INEC will be able to catch up to that uh, period of time. Uh, secondly, the uh, issue of um, direct transmission is quite important in the election. It's like a revolution that's going to happen, and it's going to make a lot of things easier. If you look at the Anambra elections, and even including uh, case management that will come up, is a little bit better. So I feel that this, uh, provisions of the law is quite fundamental and critical to us. Mm. All right, uh, first is Okoye. Let's also talk about uh, the innovations or reforms that the, uh, you know, INEC has actually come up with for the 2023 elections. I also remember that the chairman made some statement that ahead of these elections, there will be some innovation. Now in the Anambra governorship elections, we also um, witness the use of the beavers. C can you kindly tell us about the innovations and reforms? Well, uh, this uh, commission um, uh, has uh, gone a long way in trying to um, uh, reform our electoral process, uh, at least uh, within the administrative competence of the Commission. Uh, one of the things we have done is to, as much as possible, uh, reduce uh, human interference in the electoral process. Uh, so for political party nominations, in terms of the submission of the list and personal particulars of their nominated candidates, we no longer uh, allow political parties uh, to submit uh, the names, the list and personal particulars of their nominated candidates manually. Uh, so what we do is that we have created what we call a party nomination portal uh, through which uh, political parties upload uh, the list and personal particulars of their nominate, nominated candidates to our, uh, our central portal. Uh, the same thing applies to domestic election observers and international election observers as well as the media. We have also created a portal uh, through which they apply for accreditation and we accredit them uh, uh, electro electronically. Uh, for pooling agents, or what uh, in popular parlance um, we normally call uh, political party agents, we have also created a portal uh, through which political parties uh, forward the names, um, uh, uh, signatures, and uh, photographs of their, of their pooling agents. Uh, so we have eliminated the manual way of doing things. Now, more importantly and more fundamentally, what we have done is that we have more or less retired uh, the smart card reader. Uh, because as you know, 
the smart card reader only captures the fingerprint of, uh, of, of, uh, of, um, of, of, of voters and does not capture their patients. Uh, so what we have done is that we have introduced the beavers, and in the beavers, the uh, 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 names of all the registered voters in a particular pulling unit are inputted into the beaver, beavers and configured to a specific uh, a pulley, pulley, pulley unit. Uh, so when a, a, a voter goes to, the, uh, uh, to vote, what we normally do is, in terms of accreditation, we first of all use the beavers uh, to um, see whether we can read the fingerprint of the, of the, of the would be voter. If the beavers read the fingerprint, the voter will be allowed to go and vote. If he doesn't read the fingerprint of the, uh, of, of the, of the would be voter, then the beavers will be used to read the facials. If he doesn't read the facials of the, of the registrant, then the beavers has the capacity uh, to also read the uh, QR code at the, uh, um, uh, in, in the voters' register uh, and uh, the back of the, of, the, of the permanent voters' card. If all these things are done and the voters' uh, uh, particulars and biometrics cannot be found in the, in, the, in the register. The implication is that the person is, is engaged in identity theft or the person uh, is not the person who he or she uh, uh, claims to be and the person will not be allowed to vote. Uh, the third thing we have done and then we will continue to do is to upload pooling unit results into our INEC resolve being portal. We are going to do all these things whether we have a new electoral framework or we don't have a new electoral framework. But I think it is important and it's imperative and it's also very fundamental for us to have a new electoral legal framework uh, because the issue of uh, uh, whether we use the voters register, the registered voters uh, for purposes of determining over voting or we use the accredited voters has been taken care of in the new bill uh, thought, to, thought to be attended to. And also the issue of electronic transmission of results and also using either uh, uh, um, the, the, the forms filled manually or the electronically transmitted results uh, for purposes of making a determination of who has won the election and who has not won have been taken care of in the new bill. And so all these things will, be, will come to play. But whether the bill is signed or not, this particular commission will not wait indefinitely uh, for the signing of this bill. After some time, we, if the bill is not signed, we may be forced to release the timetable and schedule of activities for the 2023 general elections based on the existing electoral legal framework. Uh, because that is what we are using as at present. That is what we are using for the purposes of the AKT governorship election and the Ondo governorship elections and some of the uh, six by elections that we've scheduled for the 26th day of February uh, 2022. Okay. Uh, um, I'll stay with you, um, um, uh, Mr. Fessus uh, in, in previous times, and you've talked about the, the existing legal framework and the importance of having this sorted out before the electoral timetable is released. In, in the previous elections, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the 20, either the 2015 or 2019 elections, uh, one or two changes were, um, were brought about as far as elections in Nigeria are concerned, but were not implemented or passed because of the closeness of the time of uh, the passage of the bill um, to the elections. Um, we look at things like electronic voting and all that. Uh, are, we, are, are we confident that these changes can be comfortably and successfully implemented with an election that is barely uh, 900, just over 900 and, uh, uh, days ahead, uh, oh, sorry, 390 days, 96 days from now. Are we confident that these changes can be uh, successfully implemented by INEC? That's number one. Number two, are there any other reasons, because you talked about the legal, legal framework, for which INEC cannot um, release the electoral timetable before the passage of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill? Now, now uh, let, 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 let me be very, very clear on this. There are at least eight clauses eight clauses in the new uh, bill that are very critical and fundamental. And these are timelines that are slightly mandatory. One, if you look at uh, a clause 3, three in the new bill, it says that it makes it mandatory for the funds due to the Independent National Electoral Commission to be released to the commission at least a year before the election. This thing can be done administratively, whether the, the, the bill is passed or not. The president can and the authorities can release the funds due to the commission, whether the bill is passed or not. I've talked about the second one relating to the notice of election, which says that the commission shall 
give notice of elections at least 360 days before the day fixed for the conduct of election. That's the second one. Now, the third one is also very, very fundamental. Prior to this particular, uh, before this particular bill, and in the existing legal framework, political parties are obligated to submit the list and personal particulars of their nominated candidates 60 days uh, to the conduct of election. But in the new electoral uh, bill, um, the, the, the time frame has been changed to 180 days. Not only that, in terms of po political associations wanting to transmit to political parties, uh, prior to this particular period, the period for the submission of the applications uh, was six months. But in the new bill, it has been extended to 12, uh, it's been made 12 months. So these are some of the timelines that are very, very germane. And if we release the electoral timetable now and the, and the, uh, 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 and the bill comes in, becomes law, and the period for the giving of this particular notice has elapsed, it will now create a very big logjam uh, for the Independent National Electoral Commission. But as I, as I pointed out, we cannot wait ad infinitum uh, for this particular bill to be signed into law. Time is really running out in relation to some of the timelines imputed in the bill. But we are going to proceed uh, with our preparations. There are some gadgets and some uh, equipment that need to be purchased before uh, the signing into law, uh, be, I, mean, I mean, at least a year uh, before the, the general elections. We are going ahead with some of these things. Uh, we have made our submissions to the National Assembly in terms of um, the funds we need to be appropriated uh, for the conduct of the 2023 general elections. And we have imputed uh, some of these things into the, into the law. In terms of the electronic transmission of results, what we have said is that what the Commission needs is for some of the impediments to the electronic collation of results uh, to be removed from the electoral legal framework so that we can collate electronically. We can transmit results electronically now. But if you look at the law critically, and if you just uh, remove, in, in, you know, read it for, uh, uh, in very, very clear terms, it will be difficult for you to do electronic collation of results and announcement of results without the Electoral Act being amended to, ac to accommodate that. But in terms of trans transmission of election results, the Constitution and the other uh, constitutive legal instruments gives us the power uh, to transmit election results and also con to conduct elections. And we don't need any further legislation in relation to this. So administratively, we are doing a lot. And there are certain things we don't need a lot to be amended uh, before we can do. Including, uh, so we are, including we are, the use of the beavers, we'd like to get clarification on that. Of course, this is Nigeria. And then, uh, you know, the, the cases where the legality of... Uh, these um, technology might be questioned. And so are you saying that the, um, internally that uh, the legal framework for your uh, institution uh, can actually make for or cover up for the use of the beavers without the law so being signed? Def definitely. If, if, for instance, if you look at the uh, section 49 of the existing, uh, of the existing act, it provides that a person intending to vote with his voter's card shall present himself to the presiding officer at the polling unit in the constituency in which he is registered with his voter's card. Then it goes further to provide that the presiding officer shall, on being satisfied, shall, on being satisfied, that the name of the person is on the register of voters, issue him a ballot paper and indicate on the register that the person has voted. Now, the beavers is an equipment that is used to authenticate whether you are the person you purport to be. So the Supreme Court validated the use of the smart card reader uh, in, 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 in the election for the purposes of making a determination on whether the person that has come to the polling unit is the actual person that has <coughs> registered. What the issue is, the controversy was around whether the data from the beavers can be used to make a determination in relation to overvoting in an election. And the, and the Supreme Court said no, that if you want to determine overvoting in any election, you have to go to the voters register and all the other forms used in the election. So the issue of whether the presiding officer can use the beavers or the smart card reader to make a determination on whether the person who has come to vote is the owner of the uh, permanent voters card was never an issue and the Supreme Court validated that. Uh, so we don't have an issue with the beavers. 
Okay, so l let's bring in John Gall now. Uh, some people are saying that with the indirect, uh, pr indirect primaries clause in that uh, electoral act, it's just the tactics to stall the entire system and that we might probably just fall back to the 2010 electoral act or 2011. Uh, do you see a possibility of we having this as a bill and of course having INEC have enough time to prepare for the elections? Well, I think, I think like uh, my first Okoye has said already, the um, existing electoral act has been very clear about the mode of conducting primary, which provides for consensus, direct and indirect primaries. Even if the electoral act is not amended, political parties, both of the APC and the PDP, have used direct and indirect primaries, so it's, it's not a problem. If you amend the act, and the president having refused to attend to that bill, uh, has refused to... Uh, legalize the use of direct primaries as the only mode of conducting primary. Now, what is happening now is that I, my opinion from what I've seen from the National Assembly and my understanding of the legislature, they will not override the president. We are going to have section 87, the old section 87 of the bill restored of the act. Yes, of the bill restored back into law. So the political parties will have all of that option. My worry and concern has been with the use of the word shall with respect to the monitoring of a party primary by INEC, which was not the provision in the law before. You know, it was an observation, uh, observatory responsibility. The new law, if it was signed, would have made it compulsory for INEC. Now, the question is that uh, direct uh, primary is like conducting a general election. 8,800 and something council word around the country. INEC, I don't I don't want to feel that INEC does not have the capacity, but they may not have the funding required by virtue of their budget to carry out that process. And the period of time provided for is too short. That's where I was saying the challenge was going to come up. So I believe that the, what the National Assembly should do under Section 58, uh, sub uh, 4 of the Constitution, is to amend that uh, bill in line with the observation raised by the, Mr. President and send it back to Mr. President for assent. That will restore to us the status quo of what used to be in the old law. Uh, trying, my opinion as a lawyer has always been that, and as a legislator has always been that, trying to impose one mode of conducting primaries on all political parties is undemocratic and draconian. Now, so the, the reason why a lot of persons are very big on the electoral act or the law being passed and looking forward to 2023 is because of the transmission of results electro electronically. And so uh, that's where, you know, the whole of this contention lie. Of course, you also have the clause that seem to be stalling the process. And a lot of people are saying that we might not in 2023 transmit, you know, results electronically with the back and forth. I mean, if it has to go through the, the National Assembly, getting back to the president. We're talking about time now. So I'd, I'd like to ask you, you're a lawyer, you understand the workings. I mean, a lawmaker, a former lawmaker, and of course, a legal practitioner, you understand the workings of the system. So do you see a possibility that, you know, this becomes a reality and then we transmit results electronically in 2023? Yes, that's, that's what will happen. Um, I've, I've gone through the bill, even though there's some provisions of the bill that, you know, look contradictory to me with respect to the collision, transmission not a problem, but particularly with the issue of electronic collision of results and all of that. But I believe that the National Assembly will take care of that position because a lot of issues has been raised with regard to that. But for on the part of INEC, you know, to be able to carry out a successful uh, implementation of an electoral process, you need to put together your institutional framework, you need to put together your legal framework. Uh, the institutional framework has, has done a lot. They have institutional memory. INEC has conducted several elections. They have capacity within INEC to conduct that election. Uh, the procedure of having ad hoc staff from the university to conduct that election has been done and has been successful. The main challenge has been the uh, legal framework. Because the legal framework is a vehicle that is required. You don't have, um, you, you, you will not understand or appreciate what Mr. Okoye is saying unless you, you look at the guidelines that INEC produced before the election are the manual. That guideline is very critical. It gives you a clear direction of what is selling to. So I believe that the electronic transmission of results, which is going to be a revolution of electoral system, will happen. I believe that the National Assembly uh, will carry out the amendment in that bill and send it back to the President. I believe that the National Assembly will not override the assent of the President. And um, with that, with the provision of the Electoral Act, 
and with the action by the president, the legal framework will be effective and then there will be direct transmission of results. Okay, uh, Mr. John Golebo, you, you talked about um, uh, the, the provisions of the Constitution and uh, regarding the president uh, and his powers. Uh, um, uh, as far as the passage of or the control of the National Assembly is concerned, a relationship, I should say, um, um, with the National Assembly having to um, look at this bill again and do what the president wants, um, are we not yet again seeing that uh, national or federal legislature is is rubber stamp well it's not it's not it's not an issue of rubber stamp you know um the constitution is very clear uh, with respect to the provision of um of the, the procedure provided for the passage of a bill if you look at section 58 of the constitution section 58 sub 4 does not give the president the discretion to pick and choose the provision of the bill which he can assent and not assent, particularly because of the manner, the, the, uh, the model of drafting that was adopted in this bill. There's a model of drafting that will adopt that will separate the various provisions and make it easy for the president. And if that bill is divided into the separate, with the several bills, the president can sign bill one and not sign bill two. So here, everything was clubbed up together. The president refused to sign. Now, the power now lies with the National Assembly. That has that power under Section 58, sub 2 of the, of, of the Constitution. That section gives them the power, you know, to be able to do one, two things. Number one, they, they, they veto the assent to the president, pass it again the way it is, and it becomes law. Number two is read the letter of the president, amend the bill, and send it back. That is the procedure. Usually, what happens is that there's a lot of lobbying that goes on in the legislature. Remember that you have the ruling party, APC, they have their caucus, they have the leader, they have the opposition party, PDP, they have their minority leader, their minority caucus. There's a lobby that will go on. Remember that the governor also had intervened through the governor's forum. And most of the National Assembly members also listened to the governor. Then you also know that the president is an APC president. They also have the APC caucus and the APC, APC governor's forum. It is not a rubber stamp issue. It's the legislature at work. It's the issue of lobbying in democracy that happens. So at the end of the day, once the structure of the legislature, the administrative structure of the leadership, and that of the president, the presidency, which is linked up to the presidential advisor, happens, things like this will happen. You can't, you do, you may, you may not be able to draw the numbers to override the president, the, the president's veto to this day because of the issue of lobbying. Um, the letter by the president itself on his own gave a clear direction that the pre president was sincere, understood the provisions of the electoral act and the implications of the election clear. Uh, to that issue. And then, in, in summary, we know that the main concern in this amendment process was not even the issue of direct time, it was the issue of the device and the uh, electronic transmission results. The National Assembly added this provision, so it's their responsibility to either pull it through or withdraw from it. Okay, so um, um, just as we, you know, coast down the conversation, we uh, bring in Festus Okoye. Uh, the issue of voter party also starts with the commission. I mean, talking about INEC, usually because of the process of getting getting registered, the process of getting your PVC and what have you. Uh, what is the commission doing to actually uh, improve on the process of registration and also issuing of the PVCs? And what uh, what are the number of registered voters as we are uh, speaking? Uh, in the entire country? Well, uh, you see, uh, this particular commission engaged in what I call a revolution. A revolution in the sense that um, for 25 years, um, no commission succeeded in increasing the number of uh, pooling units we had in this country. Uh, so this particular commission broke that 25-year-old jam, year log jam, uh, by uh, uh, um, increasing access of the Nigerian people uh, to additional pooling units. Uh, so as of today, we have over 176,000 pulling, uh, pulling, pulling units. And some of these pulling units have been taken closer to the people, uh, closer to their homes, uh, so that persons with disability can easily access the pulling units. Uh, uh, the elderly can easily access the pulling units. Uh, lactating mothers can easily access the pulling units, and so on. Uh, so that's one revolution we have uh, carried out. And we believe that with this particular access, uh, the people we have... Uh, a closer affinity uh, to the various polling units. Uh, secondly, for the purposes of uh, the registration of voters, we have uh, introduced uh, what we call an online pre-registration process uh, through which 
uh, young Nigerians especially, and those who have access to, the, uh, uh, to their computers, who have access to smartphones and so on, can do their pre-registration before going to our offices uh, to go and capture the, uh, for the purposes of capturing their biometrics. Now, uh, we have been carrying out this registration in our state offices and our local government offices on security grounds. Uh, but I believe that uh, with the consultations we are doing with all the different stakeholders, uh, we may devolve uh, the registration process uh, to um, over 2,000 uh, uh, registration centers uh, to make it easier uh, for people to register. Uh, so we believe that so many of our people we are, are going to um, uh, uh, register. But you know, the issue of a voter party has its own variables and uh, there are all sorts of explanations on why there's voter party. Sometimes on election day, you see people playing football. Uh, sometimes on election day, uh, people may have the perception that their votes will not count. But I believe that with the measures we have put in place and with all the revolutionary changes uh, uh, we have introdu intro introduced, uh, our people are beginning to have confidence that they, their votes will count and they are beginning to re-engage more assiduously with the electoral process. So we are confident that despite the fact that we entered into the uh, 2019 general election with a total registered voter population of 84 million, that with the new measures we have put in place, there's a possibility that we may register at least over 50 million additional voters uh, before we close the registration process. All right, a very quick one, uh, uh, Mr. Okoye. When does the C continuous voter registration resume? Has it already, already uh, resumed? Just very quickly, please. No, it's, 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 on, it's ongoing. Uh, what we are trying to do is to devolve more to the local areas uh, so that um, uh, more people, they, it will be closer to the people and more people will register. So it's ongoing and it will last for uh, at least the next six months. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sukoye, a National uh, Inc. Commissioner for Voter Education, Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and of course, a former Speaker of the Cross River State uh, House of Assembly, John Go Labour. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, for offering your expert analysis on this particular um, topic. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you, gentlemen, thank you. for coming. Well, it has been an interesting conversation. I've been talking about uh, the electoral umpire, Aina, and their decision not to release the timetable, and also what it means for the country. Fingers are crossed, we'll definitely see how all of this event unfolds. We will be taking a short break right now, and when we return, we'll just be looking at the second conversation where, you know, the pyramid, rice pyramid has been unveiled, and what does this mean for the economy in Nigeria? We'll be right back.